We are delighted to be here today uh, at the beginning of Women's History Month. And I'm Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress. And in that light, I must say I'm the first uh, female to be a Librarian of Congress since 1802. And I'm delighted to be here talking about women uh, in Congress, and this is the 117th Congress, and as you can see from our title, it's Diverse Vo Voices Making History, because the person we're starting with, and we'll be joined by two of your colleagues in the House who are busy voting, <laughs> but right now I have the really great pleasure to hear from Senator Shelley Moore, Capital of West Virginia. Now, in full disclosure, I got a chance to see the senator in West Virginia, and I visited, she had me visiting, and she went from presenting to constituents about very environmental issues, all types of things, to going to the local public library and sitting on the floor doing story time with children in that library that she helped to build. So thank you for being here because your history and how you got to be here is something. Well, thank you, thank you. And it's a, it's a joy to be back in the Library of Congress in person. And it's wonderful to be with you in person, Dr. Hayden. Uh, we started together because of my responsibilities on the Appropriations Committee when you were, and also on the Rules Committee, and you were, uh, at, at that time uh, interviewing for the job or uh, testifying and, uh, and you very gracefully as you ascended uh, came to West Virginia on one of your first visits and we loved that. Uh, that library, we need to have you back because that library now is in a, under a major renovation yes. and it's going to be totally modernized, same building, but it's totally modernized and it's going to be a real it always was an uh, architectural landmark in, in our city. It was the old post office. But now it's meeting the 21st century challenges of your libraries. And as you know, that's, that's a little bit different. So my pathway into becoming a senator, and I am the first woman senator from the state of West Virginia, is, uh, is through the state of West Virginia. I'm a native-born West Virginian. Uh, my parents met in college at West Virginia University. My father's a native. West Virginia, and my mother was born in Miami, Florida, oh. in 1926, yes, so um, they met at the university, and my father then, um, after his service in the war, became a public servant himself. He ran for House of Delegates, Congress, so we went back and forth to Washington, D.C. when I was a young girl, where we went to school half the year here and half the year in West Virginia. I don't know how my mother did this, but, uh, or how we did it, but uh, it was just sort of the norm back then. It's changed a lot. And, and so then, uh, as I was looking at my professional career, what did I want to do, I thought, well, I'd like to be a doctor. And then I worked in a hospital. <laughs> and then I decided maybe that's not what I want to do. So I, I did a couple other things, uh, became a career counselor, worked in education, and then I uh, stepped out to raise our three children to the point where then I was watching what our local uh, House of Delegates, our local governing bodies in West Virginia were doing. And I had this thought, like, well, I can... I can at least do that, you know. I, I can do that as well as, and I had such background of going to parades and listening to speeches and watching current events that both of my parents had given their all in this because my dad then ascended to become the governor of West Virginia. So I, I had all of that experience watching it firsthand. And the first thing I learned when I put my hat in the ring for my very first race as a House of Delegates is, this is not as easy as he made it look. And, and from then I was local office, Congress, and then now into the Senate. Now, then your mother was the first lady of she was. West Virginia. She was very much a partner with my father. Uh, she worked hard in the areas that she cared about, which was uh, literacy and reading, but also um, mental health. I think about that now because I, I just had a conversation before we came over here, how important mental health has become during this pandemic and, and how we're falling short in a lot of areas. And I thought, you know, my mother was really on the cutting edge of becoming a real advocate for mental health services. And this is in the 60s and 70s. And she was always right there with my father, very active, very, had her own uh, persona as well. But, I'd say she was a lot more gracious than my dad, so she probably attracted a different constituency in some ways, which helped him. 
And that helped him. I mean, so did. she was the first lady, but also she did contribute to what you later thought was, how could he do this? Well, she helped. She did. She did. So now in your role, and you are, it's like flipped. It's flipped. You're the person. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because, you know, uh, Speaker Pelosi has sort of the same path uh, because she stayed out for a while, raised her children. Her dad was in... Uh, I think Mara Baltimore very active politically, and then she became active herself. And I think it was watching, people ask me, like, why did it really, what resonated with you that you saw your parents do and, and, and that, that made you want to get into this? And a lot of people think it's the big things. Well, I can, I can create uh, more roads, or I can create uh, uh, the university research, or you know, things of this nature that you can do. But you know, it's really the small thing. It's helping that one family adopt a child from out of the country that never, can't have children and they're having trouble with their immigration. It's, help, it's nominating the young man that goes to West Point and you go to Afghanistan and he's flying your helicopter. So these are, the, I mean, I get really yeah, chills about this, but those are the things that just, I think you, when you wake up in the morning, and it doesn't always have to have a happy ending. I think sometimes it ends up in a sad way if, it's, if you've lost a, 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 somebody serving and you're able to, you know, help the family in some way. So it's the small ways that you can really impact in a big way people's lives. That's what really excites me. And also when there are like natural disasters or things exactly. happen that you were able to bring the aid and, and help with that. We had a big flood in 2016 and that was a big part of what we did. We helped a lot of people and uh, it, 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 that's probably the most recent tragedy that we've had in our state. We've had some coal mine tragedies that are equally as tragic. All right, so the, the range of issues, and still you were uh, the, uh, really the people at that library, and I'll never forget it, they were just, they knew you, they were showing the drafts and the plans for the, what right. you're talking about, and you were telling them that, so the, the range of what you do. Well, I wondered when they knew me, I wondered, are that, is that the same mother that used to come in with those three wild kids and, <laughs> and check books out and let them run wild in the library? They probably remember. They probably were thinking that, yes. So that balance then of being, a, I mentioned your grandmother. Yes, seven times. Seven times, and then you have your responsibilities here. How do you do the work-life balance? You know, I don't think it's easy for anybody, but uh, I have a lot of support. I have a very supportive husband, and as I saw with my parents, it's, it's a team sport, and for us it has been, and that, that has been uh, made it easier for me. Um, you have to learn how to say no. I'm sure you find this in your own life. Uh, you have to learn to say, I, I can't do that because I've set the priority of I'm going to go to my daughter's volleyball game or I'm going to, I promised my older son I would babysit this weekend or, or whatever. And, and those things fulfill me uh, in terms of recharge the batteries where I'm not every day sitting there thinking about going through Twitter, finding out what political statements someone's make. You know, like everything, the fulfilling part of my family and friends is still the, 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 the what I want to say, the breadth of how I can get the energy to keep doing. And I think that's probably the same with anybody who's working. If you have a good support system, you can say no when you need to, and then set your priorities. That's pretty much how I approach it. And you want that for others. I do, I do. And you know, I, uh, it's not easy for the, the single mother who has a, a mid to low income job, she's trying to get by, you know, and school gets called off. What's she gonna do? Uh, you know, and these are, these are things that I personally had, didn't have to deal with because I was the one at home at the time but I really think about it a lot. And especially during this time. Right. So I have to ask you this. So you're senator and you're one of only how many women 25 now? 25 25. And do you all get together and talk? Just the women. Right. We do. We do. It drives the men crazy. <laughs> and uh, we have dinners every other month. Now, COVID's sort of thrown this off a little bit. As a matter of fact, I had one dinner, uh, like a, one of the women will sponsor the dinner. So one of the dinners that I sponsored several years ago, you all helped me with, we had here at the Library of Congress. And I gave out, I believe it was Cookie Roberts' book uh, on um, First Ladies. And, and so, but here's the, here's the ground rules. Nothing goes out of the room that we talk about. 
We don't get into any divisive issues at all. Uh, and we pretty much don't get into issues. It's a real personal kind of um, gathering of, you know, how, how's your family? Where are you traveling? Have you ever been here? How's your staff? You know, how do you deal with this issue? It's very much like you would have if you were, uh, you know, meeting with your church group. It's the same thing. And, and we, when we break from that, then the next day, the men, the other 75 of the us senators all want to know what we talk about, but we're, <laughs> we're a code of silence. <laughs> and we're pretty good at it. So but do you ever talk about, though, the legislation or some of the things that you're... Only the common ground ones. We wouldn't get into, say, uh, since we have such differing opinions on this is an easy one, abortion, we wouldn't enter that uh, into that area, arena, uh, because then that would just, it would, it would probably divide the conversations to a point where we wouldn't uh, enjoy as much. I tell you, the vice president had us over to her house last year and she had actually made the little cheese things uh, that we popped in our mouth, little cheese balls. And uh, we, we had a, she showed us around her home and, uh, and there again, it was just a really uplifting evening, but uh, we didn't get into the too serious kinds of talks. We have plenty of opportunity for that. And so we don't have as much opportunity to really get to know each other, sadly. And so this is a way that you can get to know each other in a different way. So when you do get into those uh, heated conversations and things, you know where the person's coming from. Right, and you you, you know you have like you have with other friendships when you know when you're when you're pushing too hard or when you need to push harder. Uh, if you know somebody better, uh, it, it helps you to be more convincing but it also helps you to know if you want to keep that friendship, uh, what the boundaries are. And, and so I think, uh, I think it's, it's been really fun. It was a tradition that started, I believe, with Kay Bailey Hutchinson and your former senator, uh, Barbara Senator Mikulski. Barbara Mikulski. And they started that tradition when I believe there were only nine of them. I know. And they were a tight group. So then the, does the support ever spill over into legislation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Senator Klobuchar and I have done a lot of things on eating disorders, on uh, rural broadband. Uh, I did uh, a thing on opioid uh, prescribing with uh, Senator War uh, Warren from uh, Massachusetts. Uh, we do, uh, you know, I'm using those as examples because that's uh, cross party lines, but do a lot together. Uh, we go to one another, I think, sometimes to be co sponsors. Senator Baldwin and I have done quite a bit on veterans' health. So there, you know, you find out where the areas are like, and and you try to. It's not. It, you don't necessarily say to yourself, "Oh, I want to get another woman on this." It's more like, "I want to start building support." And I know, I know that uh, Dr. Hayden might like this one, so we'll, let's go there first, and then we can start building on each side. Mm -hmm. I also have to ask, do you think it's different from some of the other groups in the Senate? I mean, that the women are. Together. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, there's a special, you know, I, I guess I, I hesitate to go down the, the avenue of, you know, a lot of us are mothers or we're, we're caretakers for our parents, but that's a, that's a commonality that we share. Uh, I had, and I think I'd shared with you that, you know, I had elderly parents that were aging as I was moving into the Senate, you know, some of the hardest decisions I had to make. And, you know, I, I knew that my friend Deb Fisher had a mother, you know, a mother, her mother's in her, in her 90s. So, you know, we, we, we could talk about that in a very safe state. Marsha Blackburn, same thing. She has an elderly mother. Tom Tillis just went to visit his mother. I mean, so these are things that you talk about that you, do, you would do in normal, you know, everyday life. It's no different there to be able to find some supports when you're in tough, tough areas of, of your life or your family life. Um, but I think f there is a safe space that we've created for, by these dinners and by our, um, I think, natural affinity to take on a lot of things that uh, in families and other ways that, that, uh, that need to be taken care of. And so we just do it. One thing, and I'm smiling because I'm remembering uh, Senator Mikulski talking about the f fight to let women wear trousers, <laughs> she called them. Uh -huh. uh, and that was something. Can you imagine that? Trousers. I know. Tr and they were called trousers. They were called trousers. <laughs> but that, that there are these gender-type things that come up with you in restrooms. 
Well, yeah, we had the whole thing with the restrooms over on the house side, and the men had a great restroom, and the ladies, we had one, but it was, uh, women's was a little off, it was all statuary hall, wasn't close enough. And you know, when we get up to critical mass of 67, 60 or 70 women, and we're on the floor, uh, we need a little bit more space, so I got put on the bathroom committee. Uh, one of my, it's not in my bio, but uh, we did put a bathroom very close to the, um, uh, to the um, chamber so that you could go in and out because sometimes these votes are, are um, rather quick. I'll tell you another funny kind of thing. Now, one of the other rules of when I first came in, and keep in mind this is only six or seven years ago, uh, no sleeveless dresses. Can't show your shoulders. So then comes Senator Cinema with 146 sleeveless dresses. She's and from Arizona. Arizona, right? yes, she is. And she came in, I guess, maybe three, four years ago. And uh, there's no telling Se <laughs> Senator Cinema no. So uh, she just basically said, I'm wearing this. I have 146 of these. And uh, so we're wearing that. You know, I don't care. And so she, she does. And so that, that big vaunted rule has fallen. Now, the other one is open toe shoes. Oh, my. I know. Horrifying. Scandalous. Scandalous. Horrifying. Um, now, I don't want the men wearing open toe shoes. Mm. Yeah. But uh, so that one's sort of going by the wayside, too. That's, it's, now, you can't wear jeans, and that one will probably Well, stand. but that's for and everybody. I, that's unison. But that's for everybody. That's for everybody. Right. And it was interesting that that's an extra layer that sometimes uh, women have in terms of dress. That right. is just totally that. I, talk about I'm a librarian and so I remember the first time I wore like red nail polish that was like oh my god is everybody looking <laughs> yeah. no they weren't yeah, right. <laughs> you no know, they weren't right. so you have that and you have the family things what about how you present yourself well as you can tell by talking with me I'm pretty much what you see is what you get type I'm not real I'm not real reserved, and I'm not afraid to poke fun at myself. And I find humor is really, really a great way to get get through life. Uh, if you can, if you can laugh a, a little bit every day, that sure helps. And and so um, presenting myself, I look at it as I can wear a red jacket and he can't. And so you know to distinguish yourself. And sometimes, just jokingly, if people, if I introduce myself to somebody, maybe I'm out of town, I'm meeting somebody, and, and they, they say, oh, we're not going to remember, you know, we know you're a senator, but we don't remember your name. I say, just Google woman senator, West Virginia. It's me. I'm the only one. And so I, I, I see it as a real asset because I think I feel like I can talk about the complete experience of uh, legislating, of being chairman of a committee, of taking care of my parents and children and grandchildren and so and I'm not there's no part of me that I I don't feel like I can express um, and, and share I mean I'm sure, certainly I'm not sharing everything but I mean by that I mean just be open about it so I think being a woman in public life today is a total advantage totally and it, some people would totally disagree with me but I tend to always look at the good side of things well it's challenging it is but it's challenging for everybody uh, I think that uh, as we look at public life now and you see what you're faced with in terms of social media and, and the raw feelings and all this, that's, I, that cuts both ways. I mean, I don't, I don't think that's a gender-based sort of uh, opinion. I think that's, that's hitting everybody. And so it's hard. For some reason, everybody thinks they can tell you everything when you're at the grocery store. <laughs> well, I think that's something you have in common with all your colleagues. Right, they right, exactly. And they want to tell you about it. And so there have been uh, women in leadership. You mentioned committee yes. chair yes. Uh, positions, uh, the Speaker of the House. What Are there some other areas or ways that you think women need to uh, advance? Well, I think if you look at the leadership in the Senate, uh, there hasn't been a woman leader of the Senate, president of the Senate. Uh, and I think that's a, a that's another milestone that will be broken hopefully in the next you know decade or whenever several years sooner than that hopefully uh, and I think that is because it is the most powerful position much like Sp Speaker Pelosi's position is in the House uh, and that hasn't occurred woman president obviously we've we have a woman vice president and that is uh, quite an achievement and uh, another sort of uh, way to mark off an achievement 
Uh, I think I think this to be true that, and I, and I could use you as an example. If if young girls see you in these positions, if a young girl sees a woman astronaut, she might aspire to be an astronaut. If a young girl sees a woman president, she might aspire to be a woman president. But if you never see that, it it's not that it's impossible. I just think it makes it um, less likely to kind of cross their mind. It's harder to imagine. There's a saying that you hear people say, you can't be it if you can't see it. Right, you know? right. So you, you can't see yourself or someone that looks like you. If you, you it's hard to put your face put yourself on that right. body. Right, yeah. <laughs> and that's what's happening. So, okay, we're going to get a president. We're going to get this <laughs> yeah. leader of the, uh, the Senate. We're going to do uh, more committees. And things like that. Yeah, and I think uh, I think if you look at our structures now, uh, and and where the power is, let's just talk about where is the power in the Senate. The power is in in the leadership of of either party. The leadership of uh, who's in the majority certainly is the most powerful. But there's power in committees, uh, in terms of. Um, what you see, say the, take the Rules Committee, for example, where uh, Amy Klobuchar is the chair of the uh, Rules Committee now. It's a very powerful committee. I mean, so they, they liken it to you know, mayor, of, mayor of Washington, D.C., but it's much bigger than that. So you're controlling things like how many offices I have and uh, where my hideaway is and you know, things that mean a lot to other senators. So that's a good, that's a good power dynamic if you, uh, if you're working with people. Uh, and and I, you see this, you know, Lisa Murkowski was chairman of the energy uh, committee and, and that has big and bold implications all across the country. So the committee chairs and uh, leadership uh, are, are where the power is, uh, but that doesn't mean that when you get on the floor, everybody's got, I always say this, everybody's got one vote and they said, well, does your vote count as much? I said, my, count, my vote counts just as much as Chuck Schumer's vote does because it's just one vote. Um, now getting on to the floor <laughs> and convincing people to, to follow you, eh, maybe, maybe a little bit more with him. Do you think there's a little edge sometimes with women, with people being able to? You know, I, I, I wonder about that. Um, I just had a conversation last night about uh, the end of the president's speech, and this was with another woman senator, and um, from a, from the other from the Democrat Party. And I said, "Well, I, I couldn't really hear." It was weird where we were sitting there, because uh, President Biden kept talking sort of through the applause. You couldn't really hear uh, everything that he was saying. And at the end, he's like raising his voice, and he's He's like trying to pump everybody up and you know, we're a great country and this is what you want your president to do. I'm not being critical of what he was saying, but he was kind of almost yelling. And so I asked her, the other senator, I said, well, what if that was one of us up there like yelling? And she goes, well, that, that would never work. We would, be, we would be characterized as being very shrill if we did that. So there's still that underlying that's how that's be that and everything. I, yeah. I just have to share this. I went, I went to a debate one time uh, and saw different candidates, and it was interesting. Um, the male candidates had their water, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the thing, but the female had to drink out of a cup. Oh. Because how would that look if the woman oh. was swigging <laughs> uh, out of a water bottle? And I thought, oh, okay, I never even thought about that. But well, somebody told me one time when you speak, and I do this all the time, they told me not to do this, but I do it all the time, don't put your hands like this and then have a picture because you look like a witch. <laughs> no, I don't know what a magic. man would look like if he's doing this. But it takes, <laughs> Apparently, I'd look it, like but a witch. It, it, it's that extra layer that mm -hmm. I think it, uh, when you, do you ever talk to uh, women that want to get into public service and things about some of the extra considerations as a woman? Well, I think, ever? I think yes, yes and no. I think that at the bottom line, at this level, you have to have an incredibly hard, hard shell, whether you're a male or a female, or you really ca you can't get up in the morning sometimes because, you, you know, the barrage of people that disagree with you or, or the time and the effort that it takes, uh, you, you get weary and then you get more sensitive. You just have to, that was the beauty for me growing up, going back to the first question, was I was able to observe this in my parents, how 
you have to be able to slough things off, not to say you don't care, but get up in the morning and start over again and, and develop that kind of tough shell. And that, I think, is the most important. I think it, in, for some women, it's pro that is probably a harder thing. And I, don't, I hate to characterize because, you know, for some women it's not. For some men it's harder. But that's a hard part of our job is to be able to stay focused, stay on where you want to go, and try to balance the criticisms that can be quite harsh from time to time. Do you ever hold back about being angry or oh, being sure. forceful? Sure. But sometimes... Sometimes you got to let them know who's in charge. <laughs> <laughs> this is where your mothering skills come very much in, uh, at least mine do anyway. You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Yeah. And uh, yes, I mean, you, you have to have people know that, you know, I, I'm pretty even keeled. I don't get too upset. But when I do, I get very upset. And uh, um, it, people know it. I don't have to like yell and scream or anything, but you can tell. You can tell. I, I bet that's the same with you. Well, it, and, and it's a woman sometimes that comes into your management style, and, and that's what you talked about. What's uh, seen as forceful mm -hmm. uh, in a male might seem, as you said, shrill or just overbearing. And it's interesting to talk with, uh, with young women that are getting into the positions or thinking about it, mm -hmm. about some of these. And then there's a generational thing, too. Right. Well, I think I'm thinking now. Um, my husband Charlie, uh, if if I if I have an instance like that where things aren't really going the way I'm, I'm thinking they should or or what, and I'm expressing this to that person, uh, he calls it being in Shelly jail. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> I've been in Shelly jail. <laughs> it's not a good place. It's not to a be. good place to be. And sometimes you have to interact with your male colleagues like. That. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, they get it. I mean, that's it's it's much more. Um, because we hold the same power on the floor of the vote, look how closely divided we are right now. Everybody's vote counts probably more than any time I've ever been there, one way, especially in, cont in contentious issues. So uh, there doesn't, be, it doesn't become, he's a, you know, he's a man, she's a woman, so we're gonna approach them differently. It, 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 it doesn't really get into that. I don't perceive that to be that. Um, it's more, hardcore politics. Mm -hmm. And women can oh, participate yeah. in that quite well. Mm -hmm. Right, quite well. And having families and things too, because especially if you had how many children? Three children, seven grandchildren. Okay, you, you know how to... I think I do, but on. you know, I, I don't have all the keys to the... To the I, I know what works for me and, and how to deliver a message. I'll, I'll put it that way. And delivering the message. Um, when you, when we talked about presentation a little bit mm -hmm. and how you present, are you conscious of how you, would, do you ever change how you present of based course. on the audience? Of course I do. I mean, I think everybody does, uh, or if they're successful in relaying a message. You know, sometimes have you been to a speech where you, you listen to somebody talk about something and you say to yourself, they're not reading their audience. And, and I think that's more what, how I would calibrate what I would say, uh, you know, rather than how I would say it. Uh, although that, that, you know, if I'm in a group, it's, it's kind of harder to talk in a group of friends or people that know you well, because you, you sort of, you know that they know what you're thinking and what your normal life is like, and they might be saying, oh, she's not really, she's not really presenting herself exactly. This. I'm more nervous around people that I, I know. If I'm in, in a like this morning, I was talking to a whole group of people I had never met before, with the exception of maybe two or three. Very relaxed, because I'm right on my ground of talking about my committee and talking about uh, issues that are important to them, presenting it uh, from my perspective. And uh, so there, I think, is a knowledge is power sort of uh, uh, mantra. My, that, my dad always told me that. You know, how, how do you, he told me he had a couple really good pieces of advice for me. One of them was always know more than the other person in the room on the topic you're talking about. And uh, I wouldn't say I do that all the time, but it does help to know your topic and know your audience. That's how I calibrate how I would present. And it doesn't... So with a virtual audience, it's kind of hard. Well, it is, and sometimes you don't get the feedback. Right. Now, you mentioned your mom earlier. Yes. And 
I wondered, as you think about other women in your life who either you, you looked up to or you thought or had some influence mm -hmm. on you, were there others? Yes, of course. Now, my mother was very, she was a math major, and she taught school, and she was a great support, as I said, to my father. But she was also, for me, just taught me uh, unconditional love for our family. Um, wor she worried more than, than my dad. I, and, and then, now my husband's the worrier in our house, but so I didn't get that trait. But so she, she really just filled out our lives in such a wonderful way. Because my dad was gone a lot, because he was you know, here serving. And so other women in my life, I had an eighth grade government teacher named Mrs. Mm. Cole, who was really, really good and hard. But she taught me so much about the institute. You would have thought I would have known it. You know, your dad's in Congress. Don't you know all this? Well, I found out, no, I don't. And she taught me a lot about that and taught me. She was a really strong woman. And uh, I admired that in her. And, uh, and, and think about that as I think back on the times uh, of how I aspired to this. I also think both of my parents were sort of gender neutral in terms of you can be anything you want. We weren't categorized to be one thing or the other. I have a brother and a sister, so you know they had, they had some of each, and uh, they were both very supportive of whatever areas that you might want to go into. So I didn't have that kind of burden. I think a lot of uh, uh, some people are, uh, and maybe this is a generational thing too, well, you know, you're a, you're a woman, you're going to be a, a teacher or a nurse, and certainly that was my mother's generation. Uh, and so I didn't have that pressure of, um, of that. So, uh, you know, other women, um, I am a big sports fan. I love tennis. I love, um, you know, Billie Jean King. She came to my office. I got to meet her. Uh, Chris Everett, I love, you know, I was in that era of, uh, of female um, athletes. I have a great admiration for that and the discipline that it takes, and uh, mental and physical. So I, you know, I have, you know, probably friends that I have a great uh, friends that can, um, and I can't, I can't even explain to you, but this uh, people that are just to their core, so incredibly generous that give of themselves all the time, and I think sometimes I put my head on that pillow at night and think, maybe I should give a little more. You know, and, 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 and so I love those kind of people because they, they get me going to want to give more. And so you get your inspiration from a lot well, of maybe them. that's the, what their gift is to help you. Yeah. And that's, that's okay. True. That's good. That's okay. What about in the Senate? Now, you mentioned Kay Bailey Hutchins. Kay, well, I didn't serve with her. But you uh, she, was, she was gone. Um, I have been inspired by um, somebody like... Um, Senator Feinstein, who is probably the senior woman senator uh, in, in, in the Senate right now. She's just unfortunately lost her husband. But she is a most gracious woman. And, you know, we don't have a lot of political beliefs that are the same, but you would never know. You know, she wants to know, you know, how are you? And, and uh, I asked her one time, you know, her husband was, had been ill. I said, how, how is he and how are you? And she said, well, you know, he's, he's struggling. She says, but, you know, how are you? That's the kind of person that you know. I want to try to be like. I want to try to, you know, care about people the way she does. So she's a big inspiration, uh, I think, to all of us who are sort of her junior, her junior senators. And um, you know, I, I like that. There's a couple senators on both sides of the aisle that, uh, you know, are core believers. They have real core beliefs, whether it's real liberal core beliefs or real conservative core beliefs. I'd say Marsha Blackburn, real, real core conservative belief, Elizabeth Warren, real core liberal beliefs. And I have an admiration for them because I like seeing that core. Sometimes, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you uh, who and how because it happens everywhere, there's the little finger in the air, what am I going to do? <laughs> with, those, with those two, you don't have to wonder, pretty much. And uh, I have admiration for that. So there, there's all kinds of different ways. Deb Fisher and I are very good personal friends. We talk about a lot of different things uh, together. And we travel together, too. That's a nice way to get to know people. 
What happens uh, when you travel uh, on a Codell, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's an opportunity to get to know all of your quality, yes. uh, colleagues. Yes, and you can take your spouses usually. Um, I mean, um, there's a, just so everybody knows, we, we don't pay for the spouse's hotel. It's in the room and all that comes with us. So extra expenses and everything, we, those are personal expenses. But it's a good way to get to know as couples. And that's, that's a really good thing because that completes the person, I think. If, if, uh, and when you travel and you're on a plane for 12 and 13 hours, you know, you play hearts and watch movies. Get to know and you share and snacks and, and things walk like that. And so that's good. Yeah, because uh, the library has a series of things Those for Congress, the Congressional Dialogues, mm -hmm. and one of the features is the being able to bring a partner or spouse. Right. And you see the camaraderie mm -hmm. and uh, Unlikely pairings, almost. Unlikely pairings, and those have gotten, the, the last one I came to before um, COVID, more and more people, they just found out how so interesting they are. So thank you for doing that. I know um, Mr. Rubicine is a big benefactor of that. You're starting those back up. We're starting uh, in a couple of weeks with yeah. Susan Eisenhower. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Talking about her grandfather, and that's something. and. The other thing about that, uh, and the reason why so many members enjoy them, is that those opportunities they used to have to socialize personally. Right. In the time you've been. Right, when my dad was in Congress, we socialized a lot with other members and their families, because we lived here. And uh, you don't do that much anymore. Uh, most people race to go back home, and for a lot of different reasons. Uh, both spouses are working in a lot of cases, and. and in the 50s and 60s, that wasn't the case. Uh, you know, mom was with us and could accommodate his schedule, and, and that was our life. That's what we did. And uh, it was fun. We, we got to know a lot of different members. So the women's dinners and things almost help. Well, they with do, that. because it can be kind of a lonely existence sometimes when you're here by yourself and, uh, you know, you knock off at maybe 6 30 or 7. And, you know, you don't really have a, you don't have a core friendship, you know, uh, group. So these dinners really do fill that void. Good. Yeah. Because as things are coming back, and this is in person, but also, uh, you know, virtual, and I right. still have uh, hybrid programming, it is good to have that connection. Oh, it because definitely Because when times is. get tough, you need to have that. We do. And, it, and it's, uh, it's, uh, I just applaud them for starting the tradition. It's been wonderful. It's been continued, it's fun, and uh, you know, we, we, we just enjoy one another's company. And you know, you don't have to go. If you don't, if you don't wanna go, don't go. And so, but you've had like almost 100%. Yes, yes. Going, even in the tough times. Yes. Have you ever had a dinner that unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, was timed after some pretty contentious? Yes. Wow. Yes, and we went, you know, um, I'm trying to think, oh, when we went to the vice president's uh, house, there was something really going on at that point, and um, we were all there. I think maybe there might have been one or two that didn't come, but it wasn't any kind of It wasn't avoidance. because of what it was. It was, yeah. it was that. And so did that help that after a particularly kind of rough day and yes. everybody... It definitely all... helps. And, you know, if you like to drink wine, a little glass of wine doesn't hurt either. <laughs> well, you can discuss the events of the day. Yes. Oh, uh, that could help, but to be able to have that, and there's that it whole idea of, look, we put the ball down, you know, we're that, right. but now let's also, what do we have in common? Right. And you've built, because sometimes it seems if you can build that trust before times get hard, it's much easier. And that's what we've done, uh, and that's, you know, you feel like a body of a hundred feels like not that many people, but at the end of the day, you can't be friends with 99 people all the time. I mean, you can be acquaintances and all that, uh, but it's it's nice to sort of narrow it down to a natural narrowing, and that's what the women's group, women's dinners do, and we enjoy each other. We, you know, like every female, we meet up in the, uh, you know, when we're in the restroom and have the conversation about, you know, do you have a comb or whatever? And, it, you know, life is pretty normal most of the time. So we hope that there will be more women getting yes. into public service. And if you had to give some advice or just... 
think? Well, I think the, the advice I, I give is to young women, maybe college age women, is if you think you're interested in this, you have to sort of tiptoe, I think, into it. In other words, get involved with a campaign, find an issue you're in, interested in, find a candidate you like, just to sort of follow along to see what the process is like. Because campaigning and serving are two different things. Ah. There's a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of differences. You have to be able to self-promote. And that's, uh, uh, that's hard for people if it's not a totally natural thing. It's a, it's a learned skill. You have to learn it. And, and so that, uh, that, I think, if you, if you watch a race and see what another woman's doing, you might be interested that way. The other thing I tell them is to um, perfect your communication skills. This, to me, has always been a weakness for, my, for me because I talk just sort of anecdotally a lot. I'm not a real orator type. I, I wish I could, you know, deliver a speech sometime like I hear some of my colleagues do it, but it, I ha I've been doing it long enough. I guess I'm never going to quite get there on that. So, you know, communication skills are really, uh, really um, important. And I think negotiation and, and consensus, reaching consensus and being able to negotiate are going to lead to success. Uh, I, I think we can all have our, you know, strident positions, but at the end of the day, if what you really want to do is do something good for the country or a certain segment of the people, you've got to reach consensus, and you have to realize that there's other people who have voices in the room. And then I would tell my colleagues, too, you've got to respect op opposing voices. This is what we've gotten away from, and I think it discourages young people from getting into it because they see this caustic sort of battle and they think, why would I want to do that? That doesn't even, it looks mean, and it doesn't even look like they get anything done. And so I, I think this respect issue and civility issue is something that is a constant challenge, and we need to work on it more. What about the give and take, then, with the negotiating? So if you have one thing um, that you, you're going into it, and there are a lot of other aspects of it, but there's this one thing you just, that's your drop dead thing, mm -hmm. that you might be able to give a little on something else. Right. Is that? Well, you know, that's a strategy of negotiating, I'm sure, I mean, in business, I'm sure this is what people do, executives, and in, in politics, sometimes you know you're not going to get this whole thing, but if you hold on it tight enough, you're going to maybe get something, you know, and then you, and then all of a sudden you come in and go, well, okay, I guess I can do that. <laughs> And, and so, like, we're in the middle of that right now with our uh, Appropriations Committee. I'm the ranking member of Homeland Security. Very Oof. contentious issues. Yeah, very contentious issues uh, that are, and, and Chris Murphy is the chairman. And so we're trying to figure, these are things like the wall and ice beds. And these are not how much, you know, uh, fertilizer should you have in an ag community. These are, which is, can, can be contentious, but not like this. And so we're in the middle of negotiating. Uh, and then you have to decide what is your will. Is your will to get it done, or is your will to just stir it up and try to get it done next year? So you can make those calculations. Hmm. And where do you get your counsel on that? Where do you well, luckily, that's one thing that uh, I, uh, you know, you, we have wonderful staffs, uh, large staffs that, you know, you give everybody a subject area, uh, and uh, they go to town on it. and. Uh, then I have regional reps in my state, which I'm sure every, every senator does. So that's sort of the ear to the ground. What, is, what, are, what are West Virginians thinking about this? I mean, I go home all the time, so I, I'm, I don't really feel disconnected at all. But in certain areas, you might not be able to check in on a certain issue. So you use that uh, uh, power. Uh, you know, you go through what's incoming, you know. But there again, it's... It's trying to figure out, are these incoming from people that you really know? I'm talking about emails or uh, not faxes anymore, mostly emails or, or texts. Or, um, and, and so, you know, or postings on your Facebook or whatever. You have to decide, are these things that really matter? Or is this just some guy that every time he sees me uh, post something, he writes, she's a communist or something. I mean, you have that all the time. <laughs> And usually very digilent <laughs> about you might have expressing that, <laughs> that uh, quite a bit. So, so absorbing information, because you know, I'm a librarian, I got to ask right. you know how do you do, how do you work on that? I know you get briefing books and you do that. Well, I've always been fascinated by the current events, so news, 
So I read a lot of newspapers, my local one. Uh, I'll read uh, some of the Washington Post, not cover to cover. I'll go to the front part <laughs> and then the crossword in the style section and food, which is today, I think, is the food section. And then, uh, you know, I'll read my, uh, um, you know, I'll read, I, I must admit, I read Twitter a lot because I think you get a lot of, and that, that links you to a bunch of different articles. Uh, and so I do that. Uh, I do tell my young students, the younger students that I meet, that learning to read is so critical. I had a really good teacher, uh, Mrs. Cromwell, in second and third. I actually had her two years in a row. That's back when they split classes. You know, you have half the second grade and half the third grade together. I don't think they do that anymore. No. No. Uh, but anyway, so I had her in second grade, and then when they split classes, she wanted me again, so she took me in third grade. And she was wonderful at teaching to read. So I learned to read well, but I also learned to read fast and, um, and comprehend enough to get, to get by. I mean, I know I'm skim. talking to a librarian. Oh, I do yeah. that. Too. I mean, you skim. <laughs> right, I was skimming. And uh, so I, you know, I, I do a lot of that. Um, I do rely on, uh, I do watch some television news, but not a whole lot because yeah. you, know, you could take a lot of time doing that. Uh, and then I'll read deeper on issues. For instance, um, one of the issues that I don't really know much about is all the different immigration visa statuses and everything. And so, you know, I'll ask them and they'll generate a report from the Congressional yes, Research, Research Service. And that will give me a deeper dive into something that I feel like I need to know more about. Um, and, and so, you know, we have briefings, we have secret briefings, classified briefings, we've had them on, we just had one on Ukraine and um, Russia. So there's always available, we can always call experts, uh, subject experts in um, to brief not just me, but you know, like I had the credit unions in today, so they're telling me all their issues, the local, so there's no problem getting information. It's, right. it's, uh, it's how do you, how do you uh, sort through it, sort how do you it. absorb it. The Kluge Center, for instance, does things not only public programming, but the type of uh, reference and experts that are available to Congress right. too. Same right. thing. And the Congressional Research Service, they're the SWAT teams of, they are great. of info. They, are they told great. me they were working 24-7 this past weekend. Really? With, oh, with supporting yeah. uh, in terms of right. getting information in that. So you're balancing that. Now you mentioned crossword puzzles mm -hmm. and food. So you have time for that too? Well, that's my go to bed thing is the crossword puzzle. And I'm doing Wordle, I uh, must admit. Yes, I got the one today. I bombed out two days ago, and I was pretty upset about that. But uh, so I enjoy like little word puzzles. Uh, and you know, both my parents had Alzheimer's at the end of their life, and I'm wondering the reason I keep doing these because they keep saying if you work crossword puzzles and keep your mind active, that you know it's it's going to prevent this. I'm not sure really. My mother did crossword puzzles all the time, so I'm not sure that's true. I just always liked them. Yeah, and it, it's a way to keep your mind going without. Thinking about stuff. Yeah. It's, and that. Yeah, I, I, you know, when it gets to the end of the week, it gets harder. <laughs> if you do, then you know. Well, when you think about uh, women and leadership, and especially in Congress, which is, I think, one of the most, uh, I'd say, significant mm -hmm. ways of serving and being part of the legislative body. You, you see a bright future. What do you see in like 2040 or 2045? You know, I thought about that coming over here. What would what would be a, uh, a considered a, 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 a moving up or moving on? You know, a, a, I don't want to say victory because that that's not what you're trying to do. So more numbers. When I first came in, there were 57 women uh, in the House. I think there's 120, I think, now. There were only seven of us that had children under the age of uh, 18. And now uh, we have Senator Duckworth had the first baby uh, in the Senate. There are Senator Kathy McMorris Rogers has had three children, and others have had children. So, you know, that was sort of considered you know, uh, unusual, and now it's, of course, they're young women and they're, they they want to be moms. And, and so that, that goes on. So those, those kinds of marks. So I, I don't know, if, you know, if we get to a certain halfway, you know, is, if, if there are 50 women senators, is, is, is that where you stop? I don't, I don't see it like that. I think it's a constant uh, growth. I don't think there's a number. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think that there's, uh, you want, 
you want those young girls that I see in my little program that I do at home to be able to aspire and think that this is something they could do, but it doesn't necessarily have to be what they should do, but just as one of the possibilities. So I think probably more numbers, um, more um, leadership position uh, for our women, uh, and um, we try to mentor uh, a lot. Uh, when I uh, first started in the Congress in, tw in 20, 20, 2001, uh, you know, Deb Price from uh, Columbus, Ohio, was she was a real mentor to me. She, she kind of took me under her wing. She was in leadership, and she, she helped me a lot. So I, I remember that. And so when it came along and Martha Roby came to Congress in 2010, I, I kind of took her under my wing. And, you know, we're, we're really good friends today. So both of, both of them are good friends of mine. So I think that's important too to promote, to promote other women and, and women's success. Well, when you were saying, you know, would 50 in the Senate be enough and everything, one of our audience members was saying, no, it's not enough. No. So you should know. 75, a, yeah, you know, there, 100. There, there, there's, a, there's an appetite for seeing what yeah, and the I difference mean, might be. Maybe that's where, where it is. I don't know where that, I, I guess my point in that is if we got to 50, I don't think everybody goes, okay, well, that's, we're half, we're half the population, plenty. I, I'm not sure that's the answer. Maybe it's 75. Maybe it's 100. Well, you certainly are a role model. Well, thank you. For so many. You mentioned that program that you have. Yes. You could tell me a little bit. Sure. Well, that about was that. the program that we were going to do in West Virginia. We were going to go to elementary school, yeah. and I was going to, um, you were going to be exhibit A yes. on how you could be the librarian of the Congress, uh, the first woman uh, librarian. And unfortunately, something happened that day, and we couldn't. It was, the yeah, flood, I can't wasn't remember. It? It was, that might have been. Yeah. So we had to cancel that, and uh, that's when we sort of rejiggered our schedule. Uh, so I have this program called West Virginia Girls Rise Up. I created it when I started in the Senate because, and it goes back again to the first question of where do you make your impacts and, and what kind of influence did your parents, you know, getting into this. I could see my daughter was being, a, I could see me being approached of your dad got, you know, lights on the football field, or your dad helped me, uh, my uh, son was in Vietnam and he wasn't writing me letters and he found out where he was and got him on the phone. You know, things like that that he was able to do as a congressman. And I thought, what would I want my daughter to hear about me? And, and I thought, you know, I would like my daughter to hear that uh, your mother came to my class when I was in fifth grade and that really inspired me to run for mayor of my city or president of the United States or be head of the company or be the fire chief or whatever but just to have a memory of, of, a, of, a, of a, a, an active woman leader and sort of demystify the position. So I started this, and we, we have three sort of stools, education, physical well-being, and then confidence. And then I get them to talk, and then we have, uh, it's about 45 minutes, and we talk about some famous women, and then we talk, sometimes I bring a guest, as I was trying to bring you. I, I brought an astronaut, and... Uh, Hey, um, Nikki Haley came with me one time, and Shannon Bream from Fox News came one time, and our uh, our great fire chief Jan Rader oh, from Huntington chief. came, and so you know we'll we'll do different things to sort of change it up. The West Virginia University gymnastics team came with me one time, and so um, the girls really like it. They they like to to talk about their dreams and to talk about what does it mean to be confident, and and they. Because, you know, if you talk about what is something you need on the Senate floor, well, yeah, we're all one vote. But if, you, if you're lacking in confidence, it, it makes it a little bit harder. You have to try to be, at least project confidence, uh, and be confident. Uh, and, and, and so that's what we talk about. And they understand. They, they've thought about this. So anyway, I, I'm hoping someday... We're going to uh, do some, it. Some young girl comes up to my daughter and said, I saw your mom at Girls Rise Up, and it really and it made was. a difference. Because you remembered the names of the teachers. Yep. And, and I don't think people realize the impact that they have. So I, I do want to come and be part, because I think a librarian following an astronaut would be pretty it's, cool. You know, it's <laughs> interesting. We asked her, when did she decide that she wanted to become an astronaut? Her name... And she, Peggy Whitson is her name. She's uh, done the most spacewalks of any astronaut. Really? And, and she said she saw them land on the moon when she was in second grade, and that's when she decided. She got turned down four times. 
and then she did it. Thank you, because we really got into uh, the types of things that we wanted to also share during this Women's History Month, and I just have to encourage everyone on your way out, the Library of Congress has the archives of Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Mary Church Terrell, all of the pioneers of the women's suffrage movement. And we had a wonderful exhibit during the um, thing. And we have the uh, commemorative booklet for you all on your way out, because it shall not be denied. 70 years to get women to vote. Wonderful. And then there's a new copy, and I would lift this up, but it is super heavy. It's like a doorstop, but it's the women of the Congress, and it just came oh, out, and you have that in both of the uh, stores right. at the House of Representatives good. and the Congress, so it's hot off the presses. Thank you.